Hi, I'm Peter Mezzett. Welcome to this episode of Great Gardens. In today's episode, we're going to talk about uh, preparing gardens for wintertime. It's something that we all do to some degree. Uh, we'll touch upon pruning, how to handle shrubs, trees, perennials, and uh, then we'll get into some soils and compost as well. So let's come along and talk to Henry Pat and do some pruning. Hi, I'm here with Henry Pat, one of our horticultural salespeople at Western Nurseries, and we're in back of the garden center in a display garden entrance. What we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through with Henry and talk about different types of plants and how we wanna treat them this time of year to put these gardens to bed for the winter time. And Henry, we're standing next to a, looks like a juniper. Yeah, this is a, a nice Wichita blue juniper. It's uh, one of the pretty blues you can find in the plant world. It's wonderful color. However, if you notice near the top there, you've got some nice new growth here this year. And because of that, um, you got to remember that in the winter, sometimes you get an ice storm or a heavy snowstorm, and you don't want these eventually, you know, starting off with an ice storm, which is rain, uh, eventually building into ice and then snow and coming down. Uh, some plants that can really do a number and, and snap them off. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is, you got two or three options. Uh, my first thing I want to do, if you're using hand tools, uh, I want to protect my hands. Mm -hmm. So I would always bring a pair of gloves and that... Plus is, it's typically cold out this time of year. Yeah, so good it's idea also for that cold, standpoint. it's added insulation. But here I would take back some of my ends this way here, you don't have as much area for the snow and the ice and the water to collect on. And by doing that, you're, you're now protecting the plant from splitting and having a problem with the ice storm. Even the very tall ones, I would nip back a little bit. And you now if, if they're out of reach, you know, a good pair of loppers does the trick for you. And you're, you're basically just doing some maintenance here and you're also protecting the plant for the winter. Uh, especially if you're in an area where you have plants around the house, this is even more critical because some houses, they don't have uh, systems where the snow does not come off the roof. Right. Uh, you might have uh, snow cascading off as ice. It will split the plant in, in many yeah, areas. You can get sheets that slide right, right off. So, even if you have gutters, that, that can oh, yeah, happen. So yeah, that, that leads happen. to yeah, wrapping. I see you brought some so, materials. Another way you can do it, you can take a piece of twine or rope, kind of start near the top, because that's the area that's most vulnerable. You know, just go in, tie it to the center, and then you'd want to go around and, and, and wrap it up. And once you do this, the plant's protected from the ice and the snow. And this works well for you. And then you just tie it off. Just right. bring that around here. And you can tie it to itself or you can tie it to the branch. And you've got this now protected for the winter. You have good air drainage still. Uh, so you're, you're going to have the plant surviving and doing nice. The other thing you have to do is you have to go in the house Find a calendar for 2011 and making a, a date on there. You're dealing now a date with your plant. Hmm. We're going to make it April 1st. It's not April Fool's. You have to make a date. Uh, remove ropes and twines from plants tied up outside. And that's a good date because in this area, typically we're not going to get too much in the way of a heavy ice storm yeah. or a snowstorm. Yeah, uh, we did see one year where we did have a heavy ice storm April the 1st, but right. that was maybe right. 15 years ago. Right, right. But this is one way of protecting. The other way you can protect, if you're in an area prone to deer activity, uh, you can wrap in burlap. Right. So what you'd want to do is take your burlap, uh, tie one corner with the twine, tie it to a branch, and tie the other corner with twine, tie it to the lower portion, and just wrap it, your burlap around. Go up about four or five feet if the plant isn't too tall. Um, deer are kind of lazy. They would rather eat four or five feet. They won't get on their hind legs and eat six right. or seven feet. Right, right. And then they go on to the next plant. Now, are certain types of, this is an evergreen here that's pretty hardy, but right. say an arborvitae that's not as hardy, is it better to wrap than to tie, or does it make a difference? Um, either way will work. Um, I'm just saying if you're in an area where you're prone to have a lot of deer, you'd be okay. better off. So with it's the not going to insulate the plant. No. That's not why you do it. It's mainly just for the deer that you would use right. this. Okay. Right. 
And I see there's netting in our garden center. Yeah, we sell some netting, netting is available. If you have troubles with deer, you can use deer sprays. Uh, Barbex is one of them. Right, uh, right. Deer fence, I think we, we have some of those also right. we can show. Okay. But uh, this is basically what you'd want to do on your evergreens for protection during the winter. Gotcha. So as we move along here, yeah. uh, there's a small plant right here. Yeah, uh, that this the camera is a, can focus in on. This is a broadleaf evergreen. Yeah, it's a broadleaf evergreen. Uh, generally on broadleaf evergreens, again, along the foundation of the house, you kind of want to protect them. I, I would use the, uh, the rope of twine theory. You know, tie it onto one of the main branches and wrap it up two or three times and just tie it off. Right. If you know that you're going to have trouble with ice, um, you can still have damage. You could do some plywood. No, cut it in half. Right, make like right. an A-frame, a couple of strap hinges, and just put it over it. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that way there, if the ice comes down, it's going to hit the top of your A-frame, and it's not going to destroy your plant. Okay, yeah, and these are a zone 6 plant, not as hardy. Right. So it's also good to protect it from, uh, from yeah. the weather a little more. Yeah, usually plants along the foundation of the house, as well as homes, are insulated. Um, heat is still escaping the home. Uh, we don't live in igloos here in the northeast, so we don't have that. So it's thick actually wall. a little warmer right yeah. next to the foundation. Yeah, so plants do get this microclimate, the heat coming off the house. Also, during the, the day, the sun heats up all objects, including houses, so the heat radiates off during right. the evening and right. night. Right, and it depends on your sun exposure as right. well. And it works the same thing on, on evergreen plants. The, the evergreen plants absorb the heat. Uh, during the day and then the heat is radiated off. This is why birds, when they go to the bird feeders, they fly back to the evergreen plants mm -hmm. because they are absorbing the heat. It That's also prevents the heat leaving their body more quickly. Okay. So next plant that we see is a rose. There's a lot to say about roses for the winter. Yeah, actually there's quite a bit. Uh, roses, like a lot of plants, they're grafted. So the root system is stronger and the graft area. The portion grafted on. Where are they grafted, Henry? Right down here? Yeah, it's generally at the ground level. It looks like a knuckle or a joint. Okay. Um, if you're dealing with hybrid tea roses, um, I would recommend putting about eight inches mm -hmm. of soil, top soil. That could be mulch as well? Well, mulch, you've got to be careful. Um, you got to remember, this time of the year, mice are trying to get indoors. They want the warmth of our nice home. Mice, right. Um, unfortunately, there are a few mice that no, can't find places like this. And they're running around feeding on grass seed and weed seeds. And what happens is the first snowstorm you get, they're going to hunker down into a mulch area because that's going to provide their warmth that keeps mm. the snow out. And they'll make tunnels. And if you happen to have your mulch up against the trunk of a, a plant, a rose, or uh, like that Eilish Lava we just looked mm -hmm, at, mm -hmm. um, for the mice to survive during the winter, they're going to eat the back off. And the soil, they have a tough time burrowing down in because it's frozen. It's harder. Right. It's more so compacted. You'd be better off in hybrid tea okay. roses using garden soil or, or top soil. And you say right up to yeah, eight about, about eight, eight inches you want to just mound it up. Okay, so it's not necessarily to prune these back. It's more no. important to, to mound up some soil. Right. Yeah, uh, if you um, have a lot of hybrid tea roses, uh, I'll just get a, an object. On your hybrid tea roses, uh, this is another thing you can use. Um, these are kind of a, a hood you put over them. Uh, you'd cut your hybrid tea rose down about this height here, so this can go on. Uh, once you place this over the rose, then you take a shovel and put your topsoil okay. around the base. This makes it more difficult for a mouse to go in and, right. and live inside. Right, right. So that's another product that you could use. Right. All right, let's put this over here. I think that's good. We covered an evergreen, we covered a broadleaf evergreen, and we covered a rose. And yeah. we're going to walk up the path a little further and talk about perennials and grasses. So okay. let's go do that, Henry. All right. All right, so we're walking up the path in our display garden here. And now we're standing in front of uh, a tall grass, and it looks like a sedum. Yeah, it's a sedum. It's in the perennials. Uh, grasses are also in the perennial area uh, in the catalogs and books on ornamental grasses. The question I always have, Henry, is do you want your grasses to, to look wispy and blow around in the wind through the winter, or do you recommend cutting them back before the winter or in the spring? Um, 
there's a choice a person would have to make. Some people enjoy the grass flowing back and forth uh, before the snow and uh, ice or a wet rain. I think it looks kind of pretty when you see the oh, yeah, snow up yeah, on it. It's very pretty. Um, I'd leave that up to the homeowner. I would just give a couple of thoughts on it. Uh, one of them is that um, if you want, you could prune your grasses in the fall. You can prune your perennials in the fall, uh, and clean up uh, the material that you've pruned off. Uh, the other thing is um, plants, when they die back on the perennials and the grasses, uh, they're actually leaving some insulation around the ground. So once the ground freezes, that ground is now insulated and frozen for the winter. And maintains a consistent right. temperature, kind of like a mulch effect, in other words. Correct. Uh, if you have a, a week or two of warm weather in the winter, the ground thaws, uh, freezing expands, it pushes the ground up, mm. uh, thawing the moisture becomes available from the freezing. Now the soil f flows or slides down the root area. Now your perennial might be up an inch or two higher. If you don't have any... It literally gets underneath a frozen mass during a thaw-out session in the winter and it pushes things up. Well, the, the plant is pushed up when the freezing is taking place. And then place. the soil that goes down keeps and it up. It could. Right, well the soil slides down. Slides and down. And because it's sliding down, the plant is up an inch or two. Right, right, right. And the thing of it is, is now if you take away the tops of your plant, you have a winter of not much snow, which we had four or five years ago, um, you can lose a lot of plants. A lot of people lost all their roses four or five years mm -hmm, back. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's up to the, the homeowner. If, if the homeowner, or even myself, if I have a busy schedule in the spring, I would take my chances and literally go out and prune all my perennials in the fall. Uh, if I enjoy the grasses, I would maybe let them go till maybe after Thanksgiving. Right. And right. go out and do my grasses. Okay, so it's a choice, and so many people just have it built into their schedule. I do a fall cleanup, I do right. a spring cleanup. It can be either way. It can be either, either way. Okay. But there is an advantage to the plant dying back on itself. It's going to insulate the ground once the ground right. starts to freeze. And it's aesthetics, too. People say, yep. I like that or I don't like that. Look. Right. Right. It's up to the individual. Let's walk over to another type of grass. This is a low one. Looks like uh, probably Calamagrastis. Yeah. Uh, it's same thing. You like it blowing around, you leave it, or you can cut it back in the fall. Yeah, e either way. Uh, this would be a good insulator for itself because you've got a lot of top growth as it dies back or to insulate the ground real well. Right. Um, the other thing on perennials, if it's a new bed you haven't done too much, there really should be insulated the first year because the root system is just getting going. Good so. layer of mulch. Yeah, so I do a layer of mulch. And there's nothing wrong with leaving the leaves there for no. the winter too. That provides additional insulation. Right, that's additional insulation. Okay. Good, so we'll move on up the path and we'll talk about some trees. Let's go take a look. Okay. Okay, making our way down the path. Boy, there's a lot of diversity here, a lot of good, good plant specimens. Yeah. We're going to talk about these two trees. Uh, this is a weeping katsura, and this is a, uh, it's a rivers. Rivers, river birch. Right. Let's talk about the katsura and uh, what you would see in this for uh, uh, pruning and, and taking care of it before the winter. All right. Uh, this is a, a weeping type katsura. Um, weeping trees, uh, they can hold quite a bit of snow because of the smaller branches coming out on the main branch as it goes down. Mm -hmm. um, I would kind of look at the tree overall. The leaves are off. You can look at it better this time of the year. And if you've got a lot of leggy, long growth, maybe take it back about halfway. Again, now you want to use some gloves if you're going to be doing some pruning. And you want to get that on before you even lift up your, your pruners. Uh, if you look here, you've got a lot of long shoots coming out. And again, taken off like half the growth as uh, here. This is like your new growth this year from here out. Okay. And uh, generally you just snap now, Henry, it back. Let me ask you, are you cutting it so that there's a new shoot that will come out in a certain direction or are you just cutting it? Well, if you have a lot of branch, you generally just cut it. If you kind of practice a little bit, um, you can look at them. You can see on your branch you have numerous buds for next year's growth, either leaf growth or, or flower growth. Mm -hmm. um, the rule of thumb is you have a long space here. The closer you cut to a set of buds, mm -hmm. you're going to have less dieback. Okay. If you cut towards the bottom of your buds, which is basically a no-no, 
this generally will die back to your first set of buds. Okay. So if you're pruning like trees that lose their foliage like pine trees, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, always try to save a branch. Okay. And by doing that... A little bit above the... the right, al bud. always a little bit above. Okay. But generally this is what you do, you kind of look at your tree, go around and trim off like half your new growth you've had for the year. If you feel you might have trouble with an ice storm. Okay. And over here, let's talk about this tree. Yeah. This is a river birch. Yeah, Beautiful white bark. Yeah, it's uh, heritage is this variety. It's got a little more of a, a pinky white to the bark. It's very pretty. As it ages, you can see the, the bark exfoliating or, or peeling off. Uh, some people love to see the, the trunk area. You can actually bring up the branching a little bit by pruning your lower branches. And again, this is a, a good time of the year. So you just go in and take off some of your bottom branches. And I know I have one of these in my yard. These things grow fast. I, I'll bet you they grow three feet a year oh, once yeah. they get established. Yeah. So uh, I see my, my branches coming down and actually where I bring my car, uh -huh. I have to prune for that purpose to keep them up. Yes. So the lower branches in particular? Yeah, you know, if you've got lower branches, you know, you've got to watch them. Uh, the other thing is, if you've got a lot, a lot of new growth, um, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but last year we had a very wet year. It was terrible in the vegetable gardens. Uh, it was wonderful for the trees and shrubs because they gave an additional three or four right. inches of growth. Right. So if you have a wet year where the rains are spread out, you'll have more growth on the plant. Right. Right. This year we've had very the dry year, so we haven't had that extra two or three inches right. of growth on the plant. But again, now, looking at your branches, if they're coming out quite a ways, now you can go in here take off maybe a, a foot or two. And again, I always keep in the back of my mind an ice storm or a heavy wet snow coming right. along. And actually the birch can take the weight. They're very flexible, yeah, birches are but still very they will supple. take on that they shape. They can bend and they'll usually bounce back. Right. Uh, I did have uh, a customer in here, which I enjoyed talking with them. Uh, they, they love birch trees with the weeping branches. And every time there was a possibility of a snowstorm, they would get their brooms ready. And they would be out in the middle of the snowstorm taking the, the brooms and hitting the snow off the branches because they, they know that the weeping ones are they possible, can go right down to possibility the possibility of breaking a little yep. bit. Okay, thank you, Henry. So that's two different types of trees, winter yep. pruning. And now we're going to move on and we'll uh, talk about some shrubs. Let's okay. go down the path a little further. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk about just one type of shrub. This is the yellow twig dogwood. This is called Cornus Buds Yellow, I believe. Yes. And we're just going to focus in on this one shrub, and Henry's going to talk about what he sees here and what he wants to do for pruning it. Yeah. Uh, this is a wonderful shrub. Um, during the growing season, the wood becomes more of a, a brownish grayish color. Uh, the yellow will go away. However, what you have here is wonderful color developing into the fall going into the winter months. It's actually a nice plant if you want to use the, the branches, the, the twigs in flower boxes or window boxes or mm -hmm. even bring house, put them in some water. They'll be very colorful going through the holidays. Uh, it's also a wonderful time in the fall going into the winter to look at the structure of the plant. Um, I see right now we have a branch in the center here which is getting kind of old. And because of that, it's getting shaded out uh, from lack of light because of these branches that are going to shade it and have shaded it. So this here should be taken out. So what I would do is... And you know, Henry, the older growth kind of loses its, yeah, its it vibrant loses color. Yeah, it loses as, as time goes on. Uh, deciduous shrubs generally become weak over the years. Mm -hmm. And you should be taking out one or two of the, the older canes coming up. And you can prune them pretty aggressively by the base, yeah, correct? Yeah, but again, you're after the older. Uh, this here, by taking this out, you now actually are creating more air drainage, less disease and bug problems, plus the growth that had been going into this now is going to be going into this new growth that Okay, you so have. besides that, you'd probably want to shape it back a little tighter. Yeah, yeah. And then I you'll would, see some would, new shoots emerging next yeah, spring. I would prune these, take them back maybe about 12 inches or so. Okay.
use those for uh, winter baskets or yeah, wreaths? Yeah, you use them for winter baskets. Sure. Again, now, if you wanted to cut like white pine, white pine this with red twigs. That would look it's nice. It's beautiful, put it right beautiful contrast that. in the winter. Sure. And, and it kind of livens up. No, the area where you have these cuttings. Okay, so you could say this about some other plants too, such as the red twig dog. Yeah, red, same type of red approach. twig, very nice. Another plant which you don't see around too often is the blueberry bush. They have wonderful red burgundy stems. Do you yeah. know something about blueberries, Henry? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, my wife and I, we have a blueberry farm in Holliston. Right, right, so you know a little bit. Well, yeah. Henry, thank you very much for all your instruction. Okay. And uh, I think we learned a lot about winter pruning. Okay, very good. All right. So we just talked to Henry Pat a whole bunch about plants and preparing the plants for winter and we touched a little bit upon the soils, uh, but we're going to talk uh, more about the soil part of it. This is Bill Hubley from Maximum Grounds and Bill's been an, a huge advocate of using compost uh, for years in his business. And we're standing in front of a pile of compost right now and I uh, actually was involved with this industry for many years and I love compost too, but I think Bill likes it even more than me. How do you use compost in your operation, Bill? Well, we use it in the turf. We work with it with the grass. We try to reconst you know, reconstruct the soil and uh, soften it, create a nice soft environment. So compost really improves the health of the soil. That's the main reason you use yeah, compost, it, right? It, it changes the soil structure. We're trying to soften the soil so that with the turf, the grass can, the roots can just free. What's in comp free. Why, why do the roots, grass or plants, why do the roots really react well to compost? What's in it? Well, in this particular, the, the microorganisms is what is in it. And the microorganisms uh, will release food and they'll, they, they're, they're very active within the, within the compost. And this will release food in the loom that you have. And the food but, in the form of this nitrogen, right? right? And in turf, yeah. the soil's very hard. It's very, very hard. And, and like a nice garden, if the roots can move freely through the soil, they're gonna, they're gonna, the plant's gonna do very, very so well. So microorganism activity creates more air space in there, exactly. and the roots have room to grow. Exactly. Also holds on to moisture really well too, right? Well, that's it, it becomes, it be, your, your lawn becomes uh, uh, more sustainable, in yeah. the sense that you can use less water. If you, if you take this your irrigation, you can actually churn your irrigation timing down and use less water on your soil. Once you get uh, enough compost Once you get up. enough in there. But right. you, what you want to do is you want to change that soil structure. You want to soften it. Right, uh, right. And one so your the, programs over time is you, you put applications on uh, the yeah, lawns yeah. in particular it, year over year. Right. You actually use a finer product like this for that, Oh yeah, right? for the lawn we use this here. Uh, it, it's much finer. It's finer ground. This is the Merrimack Valley blend. It's got a very strong odor, but it, um, it there's a lot of urea in it, which is a form of nitrate right. and nitrogen, and it feeds a, the existing grass benefits heavily, but in the long term, it's a soil structure we're looking for. And you'll aerate. Exactly. We'll aerate extremely heavy, maybe two, three times, and what happens is the this compost will work its way into the holes, mm -hmm. and, as it, and it will collapse, the holes will collapse, it'll work into the mm -hmm. soil. We're mm -hmm. changing the soil structure, right. that's what we want. Right. It actually will go on the top, too, and create another layer on the top, and with all the plugs break down, and that soil mixes with it, and we'll overseed at the same time, and the seed comes right up. Um, it's it's wonderful. Right, it's, and I know compost in the gardens, the vegetable gardens or planting oh, beds, yes. fall's a yes. great time for that too, because yeah. that nitrogen, the microbial activity will break down and release uh, for plant uptake in the spring. Exactly. So fall, you put it down, it goes through the first winter, and it continues to break down in the spring. Right. We, we'll use this for when we're planting trees. And, uh, and shrubs will create a bed. Will um, we'll use a compost loom, is what we call it. Yeah. And and that's then we'll use that with the leaf matter compost too. Right. And we'll right. create a compost loom, and uh, we'll do on an, if it's a single plant, we'll dig what they call a fifty dollar hole for a five dollar plant. That's and the key. Fill it full of compost. That's the key. Loam nice really rooting well. environment. Exactly. You know, dig your hole two or three times as wide. Exactly. Give that plant plenty of room for its roots to go into some nice the, soils. The, but with the turf industry, the, the, the thing is, is you want to just soften that soil. If, if you can get um, the soil soft enough, right now with all the synthetic fertilizers you, in the hard loam, you're keeping your lawn alive. With you're keeping this, the grass blade looking good, but the soil may not, exactly. the root system might not be so good. Exactly. If you stop that process, your grass would 
you know, right. it would it would right. it wouldn't look as nice. It, a lot of it would die off. But with this, you're going to create a, a, a natural environment. Right. You know, something where it's surviving on its own. Where if you didn't fertilize, the grass would still be there, and right. that's what you want. Right. Right. Well, a big fan of compost myself. So thanks a lot for informing our viewers a little <laughs> bit more, Bill. You're welcome. Good Thank luck you. with everything. Um, think of an anti-transparent, anti-desiccant, interchangeable words as chapstick for plants. So essentially, why would you want to use it? Because it prevents moisture loss out of leaf tissue. This is really important, especially for newly planted uh, plants that go in in the fall. What do you use it on? Well, rhododendron's a good example, broadleaf evergreen. Um, nice way to preserve this foliage. Again, think of chapstick for plants keeps the surface from drying out or burning so much in the winter sun, helps buds. You could use it on uh, magnolia buds or any one of the early spring blooming plants. You can use it on a uh, hemlock that you're planting rather late in the fall. Great way to prevent moisture loss. Don't forget that you should also be teaming this up with the idea of watering late in the winter. How do I use it? The two most important things to know is that you don't put it on too early. You really want to wait until just after Thanksgiving or make it that your holiday weekend task to go out and use this spray. It essentially works like Windex. You spray it right on, you let it dry. Important point, it has to be on a day when it's 40 degrees or above so that it dries on the plant and doesn't freeze on the plant. So there's your tip for how to use an anti-desiccant or an anti-transparent to make your plants survive the winter better. Thanks. Well, thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the show. We want to answer any questions you might have. So if you have topics you want to see us cover on future shows, uh, please send us an email. And I'm glad you tuned in today, and we'll see you next time.